Welcome to the West Side Church in Rockford, Illinois. A legacy of praise, a beacon of hope, a vision of tomorrow. We hope that you enjoy this message. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. I bless you in the name of the Lord. I've got an important message for you today, so let's go into prayer. Ask God to come in and really touch and anoint this message as it goes off across the airways. Father, you are so kind. You are so gracious. I appreciate you so much. There are things that I must say today that I hope that you will bring all of them back to my memory and let them all come forth in a way that will help the people of God. Our desire is to please you, Lord, and to live a life that's completely in line with your word. And I come against every foul spirit that would come to distract from anything that's being said. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll start by saying, I love every one of you. Some of you I know, some of you I don't know who are watching it on Facebook, watching us on YouTube, watching us on our church website. Wherever you're watching us from, I want you to know that I love you. It's my desire for the people of God to live the best kind of life. But I've got a message today that I need to take my time on, and I'm going to just call this a teaching message because we're so used to a certain style out of an African-American preacher, but uh, we'll just go from there. Somebody would also say, well, you know, you guys have been casual. You've been almost... Um, uh, just relaxed in the last few weeks, and now here you come with a tie. Uh, the message I have needs to be, to be uh, brought forth in such a way so that you see the seriousness of it, which means I need to put on my best attire to present what God has said. About three weeks ago, the Lord spoke this message to me, and he spoke to me the scriptures for the message, and I fought him the last three weeks on the scripture because the scripture is very Long, So I'm going to ask you to stay with me. I've got a lot to read. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, going to 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. One of the saddest chapters in the Bible, but also a chapter that will tell us how we should live this life and, give, and warn us of the dangers of getting too relaxed in our Christian experience. So, Using for a title of the day, The Danger of Disobedience. The Danger of Disobedience. I know that's not a real whiz-bang, off-the-wall message, but you know what? You can remember those four words. The Danger of Disobedience. So, let's get started in 1 Kings chapter 13. Wow, we're going to read verses 1 through 26, and then skip down to verse 33. So a lot of reading, and I'll be making some comments along the way so we can kind of see where we are. At the Lord's command, a man of God from Judah went to Bethel, arriving there just as Jeroboam, who was king at that time, was approaching the altar to burn incense. So there's some things that we need to know, and I, think, I hope that you already know them, but if you don't, I'm going to tell you just the same. Jeroboam is the first king over the northern kingdom. Now, we need to go back and talk about Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Uh, he did some crazy stuff. You can read that on your own and caused the kingdom to split. Ten tribes went to the northern kingdom under King Jeroboam, and two tribes, as well as the priests and the temple, were in the southern kingdom under King Rehoboam. So I hope you got that now, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, two different ones. Here comes a man of God out of Judah, the southern kingdom, crosses the border into the northern kingdom. He comes to a city called Bethel. Now, and, and some have pronounced it Bethel, but I don't want to be uh, fancy like that. I'm just going to call it like we call it in America, Bethel. So Bethel is about five miles. Remember that from the southern border, from the border of Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, five miles, okay. Um, now let's go to verse 2. Then at the Lord's command, he shouted, O altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A child named Josiah will be born into the dynasty of David. On you he will sacrifice the priest, 
from the pagan shrines who come here to burn incense and human bones will be burned on you. Let me stop right here. This prophecy will not come to pass for 350 years. It will come to pass exactly as written in verse 2. Now think about that. Now, you know, now in Bible terms, 350 years, we say, okay, we got it. Let's think about it in our terms. That means what if a prophet came to the colonies uh, in the Americas in 1670 and said there will be a man born of African descent in uh, the central part of the colonies that have not been explored yet, and his name will be Maurice. That would be like, everybody would say, oh, that, that guy is just, he's, he's just way out of bounds. That's how specific this prophecy is. Uh, not only did he, did he tell who the child would be as far as his name, he gave his lineage. He'll be part of the dynasty of David, which means he will be a king. Again, 2 Kings 23, you can read about that and catch up on where we are. Verse 3, that same day, the man of God gave a sign to prove his message. He said, the Lord has promised to give this sign. This altar will split apart and its ashes will be poured out on the ground. When King Jeroboam heard the man of God speaking against the altar at Bethel, he pointed at him and shouted, seize that man. But instantly, the king's hand became paralyzed in that position and he couldn't pull it back. At the same time, a wide crack appeared in the altar and the ashes poured out just as the man of God had predicted in his message from the Lord. Verse 6, the king cried out to the man of God, please ask the Lord your God to restore my hand again. So the man of God prayed to the Lord and the king's hand was restored and he could move it again. Side note again, here we go. King Jeroboam is the head of the northern kingdom. He is the captain of the Lord's people, but he doesn't know God for himself. Because of that, he needed this man of God to intercede and be his mediator for his hand to be restored. But if he knew God, he would not have needed the man of God in the first place. He would have been obeying God. Then the king said to the man of God, come to the palace with me and have something to eat and I will give you a gift. Now we got a long side road this time. The man of God is going to encounter three temptations in this chapter. Three temptations with the same focus of disobedience. And, and, and here's the thing why there's three of them. And, and I've often said this because the devil is relentless. He'll keep working and working and working. But James figured it out and gave us this revelation in chapter 1 of his small epistle, uh, verses 14 and 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. The devil doesn't dream things up. Uh, I want you to go and, and, and uh, you know, maybe you are just pure as the driven snow. You don't drink, you don't smoke. And the devil says, I want you to go and shoot up heroin. And you're like, come on, devil. No, he's going to come after you with something that's already a bother inside of you. Uh, so, so he's using something that's already in us. Then he says, uh, drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, the enticement factor, it means it's got to be something you're attracted to. And if we remove the attraction, we remove the temptation. Verse 15, then when lust has conceived, see, lust conceives when the sin, when we begin the process to do what we are not supposed to do. It brings forth sin. And then the bringing forth is when we do it and sin when it's finished or unconfessed and unforgiven and unrepented of brings forth death or eternal damnation. That's an, an important key to our message today. So we have to be careful because the devil will keep coming back and working on us, but we can prevail. We got to get our mindset though that there is danger in disobedience. Now let's get back to our, our story here, verse 8. 
The man of God said to the king, even if you gave me half of everything you own, I would not go with you. Now he said there, I would not. I have made it in my mind, oh, my will. I will not do it. I would not eat or drink anything in this place. For the Lord gave me this command, verse 9, you must not eat or drink anything while you are there and do not return to Judah by the same way you came. So he left Bethel and went home another way. Now, this should be the end of the story, and we should now know the name of the man of God, but he was careless. He was careless. Verse 11, as it happened, there was an old prophet living in Bethel, and his sons came home and told him what the man of God had done in Bethel that day. They also told their father what the man had said to the king. So this old prophet now knows somebody else has come in and done what he can no longer do, and he knows exactly what God told the man of God. Now, here's another quick side road. We have to be cautious because we can easily be put aside from being used by God if we refuse to obey. I didn't plan to go this way, but I'm going to go have one more quick side road. I thought about this morning uh, some things that went through here in the church that I, where I serve as pastor. And when we were first making our decision, our first move, our first Sunday here, uh, many, many years ago, coming here to be the assistant pastor, we still lived in Elgin, Illinois, you have got go, driving up to Rockford, Illinois, getting ready to join the church, and a traumatic event happened that day that said to me, we were not welcome. But I had a word from God. So I thought about what would have happened if we had said, or if I had said, you know what, I don't need to put up with this. I'm not going to sell my house that's halfway paid for. I'm not going to, to, to add to my commute 45 miles. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. That's disobedience. But I pushed past that traumatic day. I haven't forgotten it. But I pushed past it, and there are things that occurred in the life of my family and those that are around us that have been a blessing because we chose to obey. Verse 12, okay, long side road, I'm sorry. The old prophet asked them, which way did he go? So they showed their father which road the man of God had taken. Quick, saddle the donkey, verse 13, the old man said. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he mounted it. Then he rode after the man of God and found him sitting under a tree. Remember, it's five miles from Bethel back to the border of Judah. Five miles. Not five miles running, not five miles walking, five miles on a donkey. The old prophet asked him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? Yes, I am, he replied. Where's his passion for obedience? You know, think, you know, I appreciate the text. It's a great tree. The tree is not the issue. Uh, I appreciate the text, you know, talking about, you know, are you the man of God? He, that's not the issue. The issue is he has not obeyed God. He has not shown a passion to obey by moving quickly out of that land so that he has fulfilled what God said. Then the old prophet said to the man of God, come home with me and eat some food. Verse 16, the old man of God said, no, I cannot. Now remember before he said he wouldn't because it was a matter of his will. I will not. But now he's saying, I can't, I can't do it. I can't, I can't. I'm not allowed to eat or drink anything here in this place. His answer shows that he has not embraced the Lord's word. Now this is his second temptation to, to disobey. Now let's go on. Verse 17, for the Lord gave me this command, you must not eat or drink anything while you are there and do not return to Judah by the same way you came. We've heard the command before. We missed out the key word, must not, or two key words. But the old prophet answered, said, I am a prophet too, just as you are. And an angel gave me this command. Let's stop there. Let's compare verses 17 and 18. The man of God said, the Lord gave me this command. 
The old prophet said, an angel gave me this command. Hey, do you understand that the word of the Lord is higher than what any angel says? Okay, just thought I would throw that in there. Gave me this command from the Lord, bring him home with you so he can have something to eat and drink. Watch this. But the old man was lying to him. The prophet lied to him. And for those of you not reading along on the text, let me just emphasize. The text says, but the old man was lying to him. You have to know God for yourself, people of the Lord. The person, purpose of temptation remains the same. Disobey God. So now they went back together, verse 19, and the man of God ate and drank at the prophet's home, and the lust in the man of God has now brought forth sin. Then while they were sitting at the table, a command from the Lord came to the old prophet, the same old prophet that lied to him, the same old prophet that enticed him to come back, the same old prophet that deceived him. The very one that the devil used to deceive him is the one that God is going to use to rebuke him. Remember, we're talking about the danger of disobedience. He cried out, verse 21, to the man of God from Judah, this is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have disobeyed the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back to this place and ate and drank where he told you not to eat or drink. Because of this, your body will not be buried in the grave of your ancestors. God gave him what he desired, what his lust was. His lust was to stay in that land. Now, verse 23 is very troubling, and I'm going to take my time with this because I just, it, every time I've read this chapter, it's bothered me so much. After the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the old prophet saddled his own donkey for him. Now, in between the time that the old prophet spoke the word of God and the time he left there was his time to repent and fall upon the extreme mercies of God. In Revelation 2 and 21, the Lord gave, uh, Lord Jesus gave a word about a woman in a congregation with the spirit of Jezebel. He said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. This man was given space from the time the word of God went forth to this time. Instead, he used this time to finish eating and drinking as if to, as if to full, fully fulfill his disobedience. And the man of God started off again, verse 24. But as he was traveling along, a lion came out and killed him. His body lay there on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside it. So we have an odd picture of this, this dead man, the man of God, prophesied a prophecy that came to pass exactly as he said. But then you have a peaceful lion and a fearless donkey. It's a scene set up by God to show the danger of disobedience. People who passed by, verse 25, saw the body lying in the road and the lion standing beside it, and they went and reported it in Bethel, where the old prophet lived. When the prophet heard the report, he said, It is the man of God who disobeyed the Lord's command. The Lord has fulfilled his word by causing the lion to attack and kill him. Saints, we must not let ourselves be deceived even by others in the church. Look how the very one that deceived him was the one that now proclaims him as a disobedient prophet. Skip down to verse 33, first part of that verse. But even after this, Jeroboam the king did not turn from his evil ways. Everyone knew the man of God was dead. Folks probably began to hear, I'm sure, that he had disobeyed. 
Now Jeroboam's heart is hardened, and he went back to doing what he was doing. Could things have been different if the man of God had been completely faithful to God? That's the danger of disobedience. So we're bringing this thing around the corner and heading toward the finish line. What is disobedience? It is an unwillingness to do as you are told. So my son and daughter-in-law will soon uh, be welcoming a child, and one of the first things that child will learn, uh, probably not this year, but certainly the early part of next year, is that word, no. And they will have to uh, mold her in such a way so she'll learn how to obey. And when they say, do this, no, will not be an acceptable answer. But it's an unwillingness. You willfully disobey. It doesn't make it, that doesn't happen by accident. Oh, I meant to do that. I, I was disobedient. No, you forgot. But when you said in your mind, I'm not going to do it, you have said no to what God says. In today's church, we are not as concerned about the impact of disobedience, maybe because we feel like everything is covered by grace. But is it? Let me give you one more scripture before I uh, get, get to three last points that are very important for all of us. Look at what happened in the New Testament. The New Testament church, after grace, after the resurrection, after the Lord went back to heaven, after the church received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5, there was a couple who plotted on how they are going to lie to the church. In verse 5 of that chapter, it said, as soon as Ananias, let me say, as soon as brother Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. And everyone who heard about it was terrified. His wife didn't hear about it. So later in the same chapter, she died the same way. So for those of you who are focused on grace, I'll ask you this, were they covered by grace also? We won't know until we get into the heavenly assembly. People of God, we are in an unusual time. We have people that are pushing. I, I, I feel the push. We, we, when are we going back to church? I tell them there's no vaccine. We still have a pandemic. So-and-so is doing something else. And I find that these are the folks that didn't come to church that much in the first place. When we could be here, every time the door was open, you were somewhere else. Let me say it like this, you were disobedient. When you came to the church, whatever church you're in, and you shook your pastor's hand or however you joined the church, you signed a document, you said you would abide by the rules and regulations of that church. And then after that, you chose when you're gonna come you chose how you would support. You chose what you would do. Let me tell you, you were disobedient. I found three reasons, I'm sure there's many more, and there might even be less for disobedience. Number one, and I think this is the biggest one, there is a lack of the fear of God. I've heard folks ask about that so many times over the years. What does it mean to fear God? Does it mean I'm supposed to be afraid of him? Does it mean this? And then we get silly answers. Oh, no, don't be afraid of God. God loves you. But listen, when you look at the book, God loves you, and God loved Moses too. But when Moses disobeyed, God said, I'm done. You are not going to the promised land. Moses cried and pled, pleaded with God, uh, and didn't happen. So the Lord Jesus gave us a crystal clear answer. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. He said, dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. Now, that, that's that's a, a great word right there, but he's not done. They cannot do any more to you after that. But I tell you whom to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you and then throw you in hell. Yes, he's the one to fear. 
There should be a healthy fear that keeps you from doing what you have no business doing. Did you hear what Jesus said? Fear God who, will, who can kill you and then throw you in hell. So don't worry about the one that can do no more than kill you, but worry about the one that can kill you and kill you eternally. That means I've got to make sure with my healthy fear, when God says don't do it, don't do it. Ananias and Sapphira, brother Ananias and sister Sapphira, they lost that fear and they had no problem lying in the church and they paid the consequence. Second thing I want to bring out, sometimes you are driven by your own lust. The man of God in our text was like this. Something kept him from rapidly obeying God. Something was moving. I don't know if he left Judah hungry, if he was already impoverished before he left, and he really needed some food. I don't know, but God said don't eat. I remember years ago, and, and uh, uh, again, back when we first moved to the city, and, and I had in my mind, I said, I'm going to quit my job, and I'm going to go look for a job here in the city. And the Lord told me, no. I said, no. I said, come on, Jesus. That, that's a long way. And for 21 years, the Lord kept me over the highway 63 miles each way for 21 years. And, and, and through that, only one time did somebody bump into me, and it was a minor fender bender. And God used that minor fender bender to correct all other problems that were in, in my car before I traded it in. Because I obeyed God. Was there a price for it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely there was a price for it. But the obedience that we have to show to God is more important than any price we will pay. Third thing, you love you more than you love God. When you really love God, I hear folks, oh, I love the Lord. They don't come to church. They don't live right. They're not trying to live right. They're not trying to please God in their lives. They're not trying to obey the scripture. They're not, they're not, they're not. You don't love God. When you love God, you will do all you can to obey. No, let me say it like this. When you love God, you will obey. All right, you'll obey. John 8 and 29 out of the Amplified Bible. John 8 and 29, for those of you keeping score, out of the Amplified Bible. The words of the Lord Jesus. He said, and he who sent me is always with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. I need to read that again. For those of you who say you love the Lord and you don't want to do right. Jesus said, and he who sent me is always with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. Now I'm getting ready to close this, but I must speak to the church in general. Not just to the West Side Church of God in Christ, but to every person in every church who will listen to this. We are a church, especially in America, that disobeys God. We have embraced racism. Now, you say, well, oh yeah, you feel that way because you're African American. But you know what? I talked to so many wonderful, precious white brothers who have said the exact same thing. And let me tell you plain as day, racism devalues another human being. God said in the book, all souls are mine. Therefore, he did not say certain souls are better, certain souls are this. All souls. But racism devalues another human being and it disobeys the word of God. And you're walking in disobedience. Let me talk to preachers. Uh, preachers, we, the gospel is tarnished. And we're not being successful getting the gospel out to people who are dying every day. In the midst of this pandemic, people are dying, but we are living, no, 
let me stop. You are living raggedy lives, infidelity, the love of money. Oh, I tell folks here at the church where I serve as pastor, if you want to know how much we have, go talk to the church administrator. Uh, and and uh, she'll provide you a report. But I'm not interested in that money. That's not mine. I cannot misuse the money of the people of God. The Lord blessed me. I was in a long period of consecration in 1975. The second to the last day of that period of consecration, the Lord spoke to me about who my wife was. We were married in, on July 3rd, 1976. I love her more today than I did then. How dare I even think of doing something to tarnish those many 44 years of love we've had for each other. But preachers across America, you are doing it all the time. Somebody said, I can't help myself. If you can't and God won't, then you need to get a counseling because something is definitely wrong. We must obey God. We hate each other. Oh, I, 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 I heard a word come out on social media from a pastor of a large church and how he was just berating and talking against those that he called the liberal left. And I'm like, how can you just put a bucket of people into a big bucket and call them liberal and now you hate them? How dare you carry the word of God and hate somebody else? You are in disobedience. But then the last thing that we find across the church is lying. We're disobeying God. Isn't it interesting how in our text, the old prophet lied and lived. But you know what? He was already put on the shelf. He was already compromised. He hadn't spoken out against the idolatry in the city. He was already one that said, okay, your old prophet used to be prophet. But then he lied. But then the new young man of God has to pay the consequences for that. Friend of mine, let's love one another. I just can't say it enough. There's too many people that are leaving here every day. Do they all have the gospel? Have they heard about Jesus? You pray for me, I'll pray for you. I'll love you and you love me. Let's obey God. Father, in Jesus' name, help us as a church, as a local assembly, and as a worldwide body that we'll do as you say do. We love you, Lord, and we want only what you want. We come against every desire that's not like you. We ask you to give us the strength to say yes to you and no to everything that's not like you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen.